Diamonds in the cracks of my heart I thought not even the bed could heal With your kind touch In the small brush My heart is sealed Who could love me better than this With a love so elegant You know me deeper than I do So who But I know your touch is far more intimate And your mind's in the cracks of my heart I thought not even the blood could heal With your kind words and a whisper My heart is sealed And your passion's rage Yet you speak so tenderly You're the healer and I'm broken Yet it's my heart that you've spoken for As you pour your gold to Wow, Leah, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Leah, I'm so delighted to have you here tonight. Some of us might know you as a friend. Some of you us have seen your face on TV, on The Voice UK, but we are so delighted that you can actually be here in person to share a little bit about your story and your journey of faith. So let's go back to the very beginning. You've always been passionate about singing. So tell us a little bit about how that, what that looked like in your early years and also about how that marries in with your faith in God. Yeah, so hi, my name is Leah McFall. I'm so, so, so thankful to be invited here tonight. Um, I grew up in Newton Abbey, so uh, quite close by. Um, I was brought, I heard a few woos, and that's the first time I've ever heard a woo for Newton Abbey. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, look at us. <laughs> Do you know what? It's so, so nice to be home <laughs> and to do this at home. But yes, yeah, so um, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, my mom, my dad, my sister and I, and we all loved singing. So we were quite like a little Von Trapp family um, at times. So cool family. And um, yeah, I, I very much wanted to be a singer from when I was a little girl. I wanted to be a pop star from when I was a little girl. <laughs> and um, I also became a Christian when I was four years old, and I really did. Um, and I was always taught and I've always known God to be 
a God that leans down, a God that is so intricately connected to my life, um, a God that adored me, designed me for a purpose, and that is patient and kind. And I have always been extremely distant from what the world's view of God is, which is just this distant God that is just pure raging all the time because you're wick, and that is just in no way what I have experienced in any way. And so in your pursuit to, um, to be a singer and to get a, like a music career, we discovered you on uh, our TVs um, on a Saturday night singing as a contestant on The Voice UK. So tell us a little bit about how you found yourself there and then how that all unfolded and what happened afterwards. Okay, yeah, so... Um Again, I always wanted to be a pop star for Jesus. Um, and I literally, 100%, that is what the dream was. But I, as a child, I asked for my first solo. I didn't wait to be asked, and I'm pretty sure that's how my career went. At six years old, um, I asked for my first solo in my church, Glen Abbey. Um, and yeah, so I think I was a likable child. Um, and I, thankfully, they gave it to me because that would have been embarrassing. Um, but yes, and I, I remember praying as a little girl, like, these are my dreams, God, you've given me these dreams. Um, and it's so exciting because you know the day you're going to make me a pop star. Like, I don't know the day, but you know the day you're going to make me a pop star. So quite a confident child all around. Um, I think my theology was slightly warped as well. Uh, <laughs> But um, I worked for it. I sang a lot all around Northern Ireland, all around pubs and clubs. Um, I moved to London when I was 20, and I sung loads there, um, sometimes to absolutely no one but Billy the Barman. And um, then I would wait outside management gates for someone to come out on their lunch, and I would like run in and hand them my demo until I received emails being like, respect the gate and uh, <laughs> I got <laughs> I got uh, yeah and from some YouTube success then I got scouted for The Voice UK and everything moved quite uh, fast paced from there and this is the name drop in bit so this is the bit that is so not Northern Irish of me um, and does make me want to book but you have to understand the high <laughs> before I bring you through the loo um, I got to work with Will I Am I was over in LA making a record this is hilarious <laughs> Oh my goodness, so we are impressed. weird today. <laughs> <laughs> so I got I worked over in, in LA with Will and I worked with and it was in a recording studio and there was like Mariah Carey next door, there was Chris Brown here, there was Justin Bieber there. It was amazing. Like I was literally in the hub hub of seeing like my childhood dreams come true. I got to do a Grammy event and share the stage with wow. singers I'd look up to, which is um, Lady Gaga and Pink, Alicia Keys. And it was just phenomenal. And I made this record that I adored. And on the day of my release, I found out that I had been dropped from my label. This beautiful term, uplifting term, um, dropped, which basically means that uh, your label, for different reasons within the company, are stepping back from your record. and basically everything was gone. I was not able to sing anymore, I had to wait out contracts, and the disappointment was just completely consuming. I'm sure in that moment, you know, from going from such a high and really feeling like this is it, this is it, go what you have for me, to go into that moment when it feels like the rug has been just pulled out from underneath your feet, the mixture of emotions that you experience in that must have been like a tidal wave. You know, how, how did you navigate the disappointment that you discovered in that and being let down in such a brutal way? Yeah. Um, so I know that a lot of what I've talked about, maybe not everyone here relates to, but I think this theme of disappointment and having dreams and um, maybe life just not going the way is, this, is a lot a lot of us could, um, could relate to each other in. Um, I have a lot of friends in the industry and the industry has destroyed them. It has left them mentally drained and emotionally drained and it has attacked their self-image, their self-worth and their identity and their purpose. All things that I was very badly attacked in, I have to admit. Um, but something happened to my family uh, 16 years ago. And I know I have described my relationship with God there as being an intricate one, where he's so intricately connected to us. Um, but I don't think that fully shows you the depth of it. Um, my relationship with God has not been something that I have found to be on the back burner. It has very much been the foundation of how I function. Because 16 years ago, um, my, my sister and I, we were always close, we were always signed together, um, we uh, just fought the bit out like all sisters do, and uh, we <laughs> loved each other and we said that we would grow up and we would get houses beside each other and our husbands would just have to be close and we would be as close as my mom and her sisters are. Um, and we said that we would never let life get in the way of that. And it never occurred to us that death would. 
because, um, I'm sorry, it's such a hard sentence to get out, because um, at 16 years old, I was 16, my sister was 19, she was um, killed instantly in a car accident. And our house was flooded with people from our church, flooded people came in to just weep with us and to say, this is not okay, this is not okay. Because the one thing I find in grief is that there's nothing to say. That's why sympathy cards are rubbish. Because there's absolutely nothing to say. Because it was actually never intended. And what I've realized through that time, and I know my family and I have realized, is that God never intended it. We are living in a world that he never intended for us. Because we didn't choose him. And so we are living in the consequences of that. And I believe that God's heart breaks for us more in those moments than even ours do but he doesn't leave us alone in it. He leant down so intricately connected to bring people into our lives to weep with us. And then that's not the end of it. We carry the hope of the fact that we will see her again. That's right. Amen. We will see her. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's beautiful. <laughs> and we will, we will live in eternity with her. And once that I experienced the real hope of that, um, there is no high in this world that could ever compare to the joy and the hope that I have in God and what he's done. And there is no low, there is no disappointment that can take that away from me. And that is the same for you today. You know, we live in a culture that is saying, seek happiness, seek happiness. But one thing that makes us do is look inward. And the problem with that is then we put ourselves under the microscope. We see only our imperfections and we're left more hopeless. And the thing about happiness is that it wavers. It comes and goes. It's found in the highs. And it's never, ever found in the lows. But this hope that we have in God that nothing else compares to produces joy. Right. And joy seasons. I have felt the joy of the Lord on my saddest day. I have felt the joy of the Lord in my deepest grief. I have felt the joy of the Lord when I thought I was never going to stop crying. I have felt the joy of the Lord in incredible, beautiful season that I'm in right now. The joy of the Lord seasons and nothing compares to it. There's nothing in this world that compared to it. And it will be your straight line when, the world, when your life does this. So, yeah, just literally, just to finish and to just say that if you don't know God, I don't want you to seize on anything in your life without the hope that this provides. And if you do, you have that. If you're in a season of disappointment and you're looking around at rubble, God has already planted seeds within that soil that you're viewing as ruins. Joy, the joy of the Lord is yours. We're not sad. <laughs> We have the complete joy because of the hope that we have in our almighty and faithful God. And it doesn't depend on you if you waver. Like I wavered. I wavered in that. I fought with him a lot. If you waver, it's okay because he remains. The scripture says, the scripture says in 2 Timothy, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful for he cannot deny who he is. How beautiful is that? And so... I'm going to sing a song for you now, um, and it's a song that um, Nathan and I have done a version of. You'll have already known it, um, but I just would love you to listen to the words. This song we have sung as a family on our darkest day, and this song we have sung as a family in our happiest days. What a good and faithful God we have that is leaning down to you now, saying, you're a love child, and I am here. You're not alone. You have my hope. Ladies and gentlemen, Leah McFall. Faithful one, so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord,
It's so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my rock of peace. So I wanna stay here at your feet. I wanna stay when the world is calling me. And I wanna stay here at your feet. I wanna stay where you long for me to be. I don't wanna leave. How could I go? There's no greater peace that I ever know. So I wanna stay here. Yes, I'm gonna stay here at your feet. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, Leah has a book called More Trust, Giving Your Dreams to the Trustworthy One, and she'll be available in the foyer where you can buy a signed copy at the end. Yeah.